Well, hello, everyone. And um, once again, we're back at um, conversations with um, with Dr. Coopwood. It's our it's been a while since we've had this opportunity to, to have um, this chat. As you see, we're not in person. Um, I'm in my office and Dr. Thacker's in her office. But because of our current situation around um, this Delta variant, this is the safest way um, for us to have this very important conversation. As you know, we have um, had a significant surge, um, not only in our community, but um, across the state, as well as across this country. Um, this Delta variant has come in with um, significant force to change the trajectory of um, infections, individuals in the um, hospital and ICUs and on ventilators. And it's overwhelmingly, and I can't emphasize that more than um, more, is that the, the high majority and the 90% of those individuals in the ICUs, on the ventilator, and even dying from this disease are those individuals who are unvaccinated. Yes, some in, in vaccinated individuals are getting sick, um, but they are in the in the significant minority compared to those who are um, who are unvaccinated and are getting sick. So we want to talk a little bit to the medical expert, Dr. Thacker. She and I did a conversation with employees who um, brought questions and concerns. Since we are in week going into week two of our mandate for everyone to get vaccinated by fully vaccinated by the end of October. And we took the time to answer those questions. So we want to really banter back and forth um, today to get some questions and answers out there that maybe hopefully will help you make the decision. When we started, we were a little less than 50% of individuals that we knew of that were vaccinated. We're up to about 56%. Some of those individuals were previously vaccinated that brought their information in, um, but we still want to get that number way up close to 100 before we um, get into November 1 where the requirement kicks in. So we really, really, really want to encourage those individuals who are on the fence, those individuals who um, haven't made up their mind to strongly consider before the 24th of September to get your first shot. So Dr. Thacker, welcome, good to see you. Thank you, good to see you. All right. Um, Dr. Thacker is a, a wealth of information and we're gonna ask her a couple questions and, um, and then you're, able, you're welcome to add anything that we don't ask as well um, that you feel is relevant to this conversation. So the first question is, why should kids 12 and up get the vaccine? So the vaccine's been, you know, proven safe. It's been given an EUA for an emergency use authorization by the FDA for children 12 and 15 and full approval as of today for children 16 and up. Um, children are more susceptible to the Delta variant. So far, data has shown that their rate of hospitalization and the rate of serious illness has gone up. Um, Shelby County specifically has the highest rate of pediatric case rate for COVID in the entire state. Tennessee is the second highest state in the United States. So it's not good for us. Um, vaccinating children will help protect the children who are under 12 and not eligible as their siblings and other children in schools that are eligible are vaccinated. Um, in addition to protecting the child that is vaccinated. Once vaccinated, the risk of, con of Contracting COVID is significantly reduced. Um, for those who do have breakthrough infections, the time period during which they're infectious has been shown to be shorter. So it benefits not just the child themselves with the rate being high here particularly, but it also helps reduce the rate of transmission overall. Um, well, well that's, that's important information and we're seeing that the people in the ICUs, we're hearing stories locally as it relates to Le Bonner. Um, and, and other children's hospitals across the country are, have a very high um, inpatient rate of, of children, which we didn't see prior to the Delta variant. So um, 
we not only would love for our employees to get vaccinated, but we also want you to, to consider um, getting your kids vaccinated if they're 12 and up. Now you mentioned something in there, you kind of slid it in, but I want you to highlight a little more. What does approved mean? What changed this morning with the FDA from as it was um, prior to this morning? So before today, the vaccine had what's called an emergency use authorization. So whenever a clinical trial is conducted for any medication or vaccine, it's monitored in a way where they consistently throughout the trial pay really close attention to sort of risk versus benefit. Um, an example would be if a trial had a lot of bad outcomes and the trial may be stopped before the, the planned end of the trial. Conversely, if the benefit's clear, and the risk is low, partially through the trial, then they and they show the benefit outweighs the risk, they can give an emergency use, au use authorization, which is what happened with COVID. It had been shown to be safe early on in the trial, and because of the risk of COVID, which at that point in time outweighed the benefit, was outweighed benefit-wise by the vaccine, they went ahead and gave it an emergency use authorization. As of today, they've actually completed the trial and they've met the usual standards. So the FDA has certain standards that are met, have to be met by any drug they give full approval to. So now the Pfizer COVID vaccine has met those standards and has received full approval. So the trial is over, it's been found to be safe, but the overall benefit far outweighs the risks. And from this time kind of moving forward, they will monitor by using what's called VAERS or the Vaccine um, Adverse Event Reporting System to monitor for our adverse outcomes and any issues though so that, and that's the same system that's used for all vaccines. Um, that's it. So, so that's great news. Um, that has been some of the um, resistance or, or failure to get vaccinated for a, a certain population that says, hey, this is still investigational um, we'll get vaccinated once the FDA clears it. Well, today the FDA has, has cleared it. Um, and so if that is your reason not to be vaccinated, I'm happy to say that that's been cleared with plenty of time for you to get your two doses um, prior to October 31st. Um, so let's just stick with this child theme and let's talk about the pregnant female, the unborn um, baby and the infant that is breastfeeding. A lot of concern was, has been raised around um, that population of, of individuals, whether they're pregnant, postpartum and breastfeeding and, and the, the risk or value to the infants that are receiving that breast milk. So for, I'll kind of start with pregnant women because it's really a continuum from, from pregnancy to breastfeeding. So the, the body sort of naturally dials back the immune system during pregnancy. And it does this to prevent the mother's body from attacking the baby, which is sort of foreign. Um, because of this necessary adaptation, the women are more susceptible to all infections during pregnancy. And that includes COVID. Um, in addition to that, during pregnancy, women have an increase in the demand for oxygen because of them needing to supply both themselves and the fetus. And then, of course, their uterus is growing during pregnancy, and as it becomes larger, it presses on the organs and the diaphragm, which reduces the ability of the lungs to expand. And this is really important in COVID infection because when people have a COVID infection, we tend to prone them, which is to roll them over onto their stomach. And what that does is allow the lungs to expand more so they can use more of that lung tissue to oxygenate. And in pregnancy, they sort of start at a disadvantage because of the space the uterus is taking up. And it's also difficult to prone them though we can do it, um, but it's gonna have less benefit because of the pressure on the lungs. Because of all of this, there is a significant risk of, of illness, particularly with respiratory viruses. And then we've seen that sort of show up as an increase in severe illness, particularly with the Delta variant. And I don't think we really know exactly why that variant seems to be particularly bad in pregnancy, but it is definitely the case. And I think it'll probably be one of those things where we learn what those reasons are as time goes on. But what is clear is that the risk in pregnancy is high and there's really good data for the safety of the vaccine in pregnancy now. So, 
In addition to being vaccinated and the vaccine protecting the mother during pregnancy, it also can protect the fetus and the newborn. So all mothers pass antibodies during pregnancy to the infant, and that allows them when they're born to have some protective antibodies until they can make their own. And babies really don't make their own antibodies until about two to three months of age is when that process starts. Um, we call that passive immunity. And breastfeeding is actually sort of a continuation of that passive immunity. So a, a vaccinated mother would still be secreting antibodies that would be in the breast milk. And a newborn who, who is breastfed would take in those antibodies. So it's really two opportunities to provide passive immunity to the infant in addition to protecting the mother. And, and everything that you stated today is consistent with what ACOG and the um, neonatologists and all have been, have, have officially stated as it relates for its safety for um, the pregnant female as well as um, the breastfeeding mother. Yes, it is consistent. All right, very good. Um, so then the, the next question is, is for those, you hear a lot about um, natural immunity, meaning I had COVID last week, so therefore I'm covered for forever. Why do I need to get a vaccine if I, if I survived my COVID infection? Um, we heard a lot of those questions when we were thing, you know, that I, and I feel that I have enough antibodies to fight off the Delta variant. Help me and help those who have recently had COVID or have had COVID in the last year, help um, them understand, are they covered and do they still need the vaccine? So um, after a natural infection with COVID, we do know that there are antibodies formed and that's, expected. And I think the hope early on is that it would confer more sort of lasting immunity. It turns out not so much. Um, the, the data show that people who previously were infected who are unvaccinated have approximately double the risk of a repeat infection compared to someone who's vaccinated. So it doesn't confer the level of immunity the vaccination does. And it, it makes sense if you think about the vaccine dosing as two doses, because you have sort of a priming dose and then you have a second dose, which gives a, the first dose sort of tells your immune system, here is something foreign and gets it sort of ready to recognize it quickly. And then the second dose acts as sort of a booster dose to say, okay, now it's time to really form some antibodies to this. The natural infection process is probably not even as efficient as the first dose of the vaccine, just mm -hmm. based on the way the virus utilizes the cells and sort of evades detection. And so the first, the infection itself is still considered not adequate and the data support that, that it's still the recommendation that a patient, as soon as they're out of isolation, receive the um, first dose of the vaccine. And um, continue on with both doses. Very good. So I, 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 you know, we also heard about this is new technology and, and this vaccine happened so quick, I don't trust it. And, um, you know, it, this, it alters my DNA. Help me. And I, I heard you um, say it very clearly in our, in our one-on-one -on -one sessions with employees. Help, help answer those questions uh, if you can. Okay. So the, va the vaccine is, of course, quick because we didn't know about COVID until a year and a half, two years ago. So it's new. So everything about it is, is new. We, I think there have been a lot of fears about the speed with, with, with which research has happened. And I would say to that that the standards have not changed. What changed is that we dropped everything else. All funding, all focus, all manpower went into completing clinical trials for COVID treatments and COVID vaccines early on. And so what that allowed us to do was to meet the same standard, but in a shorter timeline. And then the way we did that was by um, sort of completing the later phases of the clinical trial more simultaneously, almost overlapping, um, which is usually the limit is, is not the standards, it's the money and the time and the manpower to do that with most trials. 
The second thing I would say is that as far as safety, the, the COVID vaccine is a snippet of mRNA, a, a tiny little piece that an mRNA is essentially the pattern the body uses to make proteins. And that mRNA technology has been around a long time. It's been being studied for at least 30 years. And the problem with it was getting the mRNA into the human cell to be turned into something. And the, the technology that need, was needed ended up being this sort of nanolipid, it's called, it's just a, a, it's a fat envelope around this mRNA to protect it long enough to allow it an opportunity to get into the human cell. And there it uses what's called the ribosomes of the cell, which is essentially like a sewing machine that cranks out the proteins from this pattern. The mRNA cannot enter the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is at. So it never interacts with your DNA. It doesn't have any ability to influence the DNA and it only sticks around for you know, less than two weeks. Probably most of it's gone in a few days, which is really why you need the second dose because your body, it clears it so fast that you have to have a second dose to get a sufficient response. The actual virus itself contains that same snippet of mRNA so whether you're infected or whether you get the vaccine, you're going to be exposed to that same little piece of mRNA. The problem with the virus is that it contains a lot of other mRNA and it works by the same process. It enters your cells, it uses your, your cells to make more viral particles. So it replicates itself. And we don't really know all the effects of the virus. And so when we make these decisions about what we recommend, it's always a risk versus benefit consideration. And we've you know, given this vaccine to hundreds of millions of people at this point. It's probably the most well-studied vaccine of my lifetime, which is really impressive given the amount of time that it's been since this virus developed. And it, it, the risks of that are very small. They're not nothing, but it's very small. And it's certainly outweighed by, I mean, it's the risk of the virus is just enormous. And there's so much we don't know about how it affects the heart, the kidneys. We know that there are probably some long-term effects and we can see from the illness that patients have in the hospital and they leave still very ill in a lot of cases. Um, and so the, the, the benefit far outweighs the risk. It's much less risky to have that tiny little mRNA particle that we know for certain is cleared by the body very quickly and has no known you know, harmful effects versus that same snippet of mRNA in the virus itself, making all of those viral particles. Well, that, that's extremely um, informative. And, and, and this, is, this is one of those things that I'm up there in age um, and, and I don't know anybody who had polio. Um, and then there's a reason why I don't know that there's anybody who had polio because there was a polio vaccine that was developed. March of Dimes was a big, was a big um, um, contributor to raising funds for the polio vaccine and, and, it, and its um, creation and distribution. And because America and the world um, got the polio shot, um, we don't see polio um, anymore and smallpox and all those other devastating diseases that were out there that were, were rendered invisible because of a vaccine was created, vaccine was taken, um, and, and, and now we don't see it. And so we're seeing the second surge of COVID because we're not getting that level of, of vaccination rate that we need in order to not allow this virus to replicate. And so um, th that's, there's nothing else that I can say is, is if we all do this together, um, we can render, um, hopefully we can render um, coronavirus um, as a blurb in a history textbook or a medical textbook, pretty much like polio and smallpox are um, today. So kind of the last question is, I hear you talk about shot one and shot two, and now that um, there's conversations about eight months after you're fully vaccinated, 
there's some recommendations out there around shot pre or a booster shot. Um, any information you can share about that? Yes, so there is an EUA now for a, a booster shot or a third dose. It's the, the booster dose is the same as dose one and two. They're all the same dose given over time. Um, we have other vaccines that, are, that have um, sort of booster doses like the MMR that we give children. They get several doses of that over their lifetime. And the reason that was decided is because over time, you study how long immunity lasts. And some of our vaccines, we do not track that long like the flu vaccine. And therefore we get a new one every year because that virus mutates so fast that it's really not worth studying for 10 years. But for this particular vaccine, they have been still following and studying. And one of the things they found was that over a six, seven, eight month period, the level of antibodies starts to wane some. Um, so what they've recommended now is a third dose for patients who have immune deficiencies or are compromised immune systems where they may not form as robust a response to a vaccine. And then late September sometime, I think right now, everybody sort of thinks around September 20th, they're expecting approval for a booster dose for everyone. And that, recommend, that recommendation that eight months after the second dose, you receive a third dose. Well, um, I, I want everyone to get that third dose, but first we have to get shot one and two. We have to get our percentages up from 56% to 100%. Um, and I would, my preference is that we do this without losing any employees. I know some people are very adamant about not taking this vaccine. Um, we care about you. We care about your health, the health of the community and your family. Um, and that's why we stepped out and said, um, in order to work in this healthcare environment, um, the, we, we want you to be there for our patients. We want you to be healthy. We don't want you on the ventilator. Some of the most unfortunate testimonies are those who are about to go on the vent and say, I should have taken the shot. And we don't want anyone, any employee of Regional One Health to have that testimony um, that says, I should have taken that shot. I should have listened, I should have done. Um, we want you to take this opportunity to get the shot between now and the, around the 24th of September so that by November 1st or the 31st of October, you can be fully vaccinated. Um, I thank you, Dr. Thacker, for all you do on a daily basis. You pretty much cleared out the COVID unit a couple months ago and took a breath. Um, and, and here we are again. Um, so I'm looking forward to the day where we can, again, close down the COVID unit and get back to taking care of high blood pressure and thyroid disease and um, all the other stuff that we, that COVID has kind of um, pushed out. So thank you for your taking this time to share with our, all of our employees. And, and are you available if someone wants to contact you for questions? Anytime. I find myself having this conversation frequently and I do not mind at all. I would, I would love to. <laughs> Very good. Let's, you know, instead of going to Facebook and Google, let's go to um, drthacker.com um, for your information. And so that's not real, a real uh, URL, but let's go to Dr. Thacker to get the real truth about this vaccination, about this virus, and about how we can all save ourselves, our communities, and our families. So with that, we sign off and um, till next time, I hope everyone has a great day.